in Jesus' precious name. For the message this morning, let's uh, turn our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. We're going to look at the last few verses of this chapter. Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 33 to 39. Luka Swarta, Ido Adhyamu, Mopai Mudinchi, Mopai Tumido Vachnum, Uttara Pratitram Vachadukini, the Inuaki Parchilan Kalam. We will uh, read it responsibly and then move into receiving the word prayerfully as we look to the Lord in prayer. Let's read uh, the word of God for the message this morning. Luke chapter 5, verse 33 onwards. And they came and said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise the disciples of the Pharisees. But thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. And then shall they fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles. Else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. Verse 39, No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for this privilege of coming into your courts and worshipping the true and the living God that you are a God who conquered death and is risen and is alive, able to not just understand us, not just know us, but speak to us that life and breath that you have, that we may receive thy word which has life in it, that we may live out according to the high calling that you have given to us as your children. Here we are as your people, bought with your precious blood, desiring, longing to hear your voice, that our lives may be built up, our lives may be renewed, our lives may be revived, our lives may be regenerated for those that are yet to receive you. Father, we pray that your word would quicken us. Your word would do all that you long to work in us, that we may work out our salvation in fear and trembling. We pray that you would bless our time together. Be with us through the ministry of your word. Unable as I am to do anything, Father, speak through me, to me, to each one of us. And uh, may you make us all that you long us to become as your people. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Man in this world lives on a quest for newness. We we are intrigued by the newness that we long for and uh, there's something intriguing in something uh, whatever you might uh, want to get that is new. That's why every, every year that begins we begin to wish each other happy new year without not knowing in a few weeks or by the month of March now, it's no more new after, by the month of April now, it's time is flying so fast. And uh, we find that there is not so much new. And uh, as uh, we try to keep up with that passion for newness, we buy new things, we wear new clothes, we also try new gadgets, maybe new phones or new iPhones whenever they're released. And uh, within a span of some time, we would find that uh, there is this monotony, monotony of the old that gets in so quickly. Now, 
the Bible has asked and answered that question for us. In the wisdom of the words of Solomon, we find in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, he says, Is there anything new under the sun? And he also not just asks, but the Bible answers it affirmatively in keeping with the words of some famous men who said, All new news is old news happening to new people. And we think sometimes uh, there's something new happening. Uh, we try to listen to news every day, read news every day, think that there is... I mean, news comes from this word called new, by the way, uh, where there's something new happening and so that we can get our attention to. But the reality is, as in the words of a famous man who says, all new news is old news happening to new people, it seems. There's nothing new that is happening that has never happened. It only is happening to new people. And so, in this passion and quest for newness, we are lost as to how we can get that passion satisfied and that uh, newness really being new um, on a lasting basis. We, when we think about that, we have the answers in the scripture for that. And so, in today's scripture portion, we're going to come looking at two portions, actually. The seven verses that we read uh, are simply divided into two small portions. It's a continuation of a question and discussion that the Pharisees and scribes who began to follow Jesus, not to know and understand and have a personal relationship, but to catch him at some thinks that he might be wrong in his, in his teaching or in his preaching or in, his, uh, in, his life, in the life of the disciples. They were always after Jesus and his disciples to catch and ask and uh, hold him accountable for what he might say or do, which is in not keeping with their religious tradition. So... We continue in chapter 5, verses 33 onwards. Before that, we are continuing in this Gospel of Luke, where the theme of this Gospel is that the Son of Man had come to seek and save that which was lost. We have our Lord Jesus Christ giving that purpose statement in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. He says, as he meets Zacchaeus, he says, This is the purpose he came. And Luke records to us the humanity of Christ unlike no one else. We see how he is so understanding of this human nature, the, the things that we go through. And uh, he not only understands, but as a divine uh, personality, he also in compassion acts and he deals with fallen men like you and me and those that were there. And so we find how Luke is walking us through the interactions that he had, not just with his disciples, but people that, like Pharisees and scribes who were following after Jesus. And so in this question that was raised in verses 33, this is a continuation of the question that they asked in verse 30. Luke 5 verse 30, the disciples, the Pharisees and scribes murmured against disciples saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? So for that Jesus had an answer. He said, I have come as physician to heal the sick and not the healthy. And so he answered the part of why he is eating with the sinners or the publicans. But he didn't answer the next part which is the eating part. Now in verse 32 on, verse 33 onwards, the Pharisees move on to ask that question. And they say, unlike the disciples of John and unlike the disciples of Pharisees, why is it that their, your disciples are into feasting rather than fasting? That is the question that was asked. Now, Jesus, apart from answering those questions, about eating and fasting prayers, he leads them into, and also us, into the parables about stitching and fermenting. 
stitching of the old garments and fermenting of the wine that he talks about. In those two parables, Jesus is communicating to us about how the newness that Christ brings in is radically new. It is so radically new and different that this old system of the pharisaical and the Levitical system that the Mosaic law that the Pharisees have taught and embraced can't not, not even can understand but come close to in trying to do some patchwork that they want Jesus to consider. And so Jesus gives through those parables about his work being so radically new rather than any kind of repair work or a patchwork. Now, as I talk about these two things, um, I want to continue on that pro process that a survey was done about what Christianity is in just one or two words. What do you think Christianity is in one or two words? Um, when you are asked a question, what would be your answer? Somebody comes and asks you, what is Christianity in one word? Some words, some people went on to say redeemed. Some people went on to say salvation. There are many good words that come to our mind as we think about Christianity. Um, and all those are true. And one of the um, man of God says, it is life change new inside out. These, these are also some words that were used. As all those things are true, when we think about new, we come to see that the newness that Jesus gives to us is inside out and it is radical as opposed to the external changes that all the religion and the religiosity suggests. So Christianity is not an outward religiosity or external piety, but it is an internal reality and true novelty. And so my title for this message today, this morning is The Lord of True Novelty. By the way, this word novelty means newness. That lasts, that lasts uh, beyond our life as well. Because Christian life begins with this work of regeneration where the Bible describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, All things are new. Behold, all things are of God and they are radically new. There is this new creation work that begins the journey of Christian life, which actually goes on to becoming so complete that when it is done at the end of it, where Jesus in Revelation chapter 21 verse 5, he says, Behold, I make all things new. Not only he begins in the inside of us, giving us a new heart, a new creation that we are made, a new mind, a mind of Christ, a new way of thinking, a new thirst, new hunger, new passions. In fact, they move on to becoming more and more new as days go by. To such an extent that this old self or this old body that decays is taken out to becoming the new and everlasting glorious body to be placed in this new heaven and new earth where everything, where Jesus truly says in Revelation 21 verse 5, Behold, all things are new and that is the beauty of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ where nothing would end up in becoming in, in any way old but rather more and more new as days go by. And then that passion of that intruding desire of having and keeping things new will remain forever. I don't know about you, sometimes uh, when we have in our families, our spouses would complain, you've been with me 15 years and you don't know me that well. You, you have not understood me. They keep complaining about whatever we might uh, fall short of. My wife is showing her, her finger here. <laughs> <laughs> we all have such things happening in our lives. But the reality is, 
that uh, on another side of the coin it is like that is the new thing that we discover every every day every year we have new things that we discover about each other that is how we come to understand and uh, marital life is a lifelong process of learning we learn each other we understand each other we know each other there is always new you never get exhausted that you have known your spouse enough and that is a reality and uh, above all you have you would never get exhausted knowing lord jesus enough because he is wonderful he is too wonderful for you to get bored my children now and then keep coming to me and saying daddy i'm bored <laughs> i'm bored and uh, it might be just a day or two that, that they got a new toy but that toy had become so boring and says i'm bored and uh, often the the usual uh, usual thought process is that you might give a gadget or so to kind of get to looking at some new video or playing that new game or something like that so he comes and says i'm bored and uh, i'm saying actually uh, a quote i i know my little one would not understand this quote the bible says this quote was made by a man of god who says uh, don't get bored there are 1165 pages of the bible I, i forgot that quote it says pages of the bible and so many chapters of the bible waiting for you to discover the mind of god and we never think that way we 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 think we all know the bible so well and uh, there are some intriguing questions that would keep us on a quest in the wonder of the wisdom of god is beyond where paul who in romans chapter 11 verse 35 he says this about the wisdom of god romans chapter 11 verse 33 he says oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out and yet you and i like my child my, my like my son would say i'm getting bored sometimes now coming back to the portion where jesus is addressing about the fasting question he says this um, as he begins to answer this fasting question he says about how can the bride groom's people be at fasting when they are with the bridegroom and he begins to allude to the imagery of a marriage and uh, the eschat- eschatological images of of god showing to this the marriage supper where jesus as he was the bridegroom he was with his disciples christian life is about intimate relationship so much so that our god calls his people as his own bride and so we come to that intimate relationship not a religion but a relation that we come to enjoy in our lord jesus christ and so Jesus uses that imagery to help them understand that as long as Jesus was with them as long as the bride groom is with them there is no fasting there is feasting that's why when there is this presence of god when there is this fellowship of god's people we do have a joy that surrounds our life christian life is not a life of of long faces sitting down and not even smiling trying to act like serious faces that uh, we are so serious that we don't even have a smile that's not a christian life the bible describes rejoice in the lord only then we come to understand what christian life is that there is always this undercurrent of joy that is a reality in christian life and so as in keeping with that we come to see that we celebrate the joy that we have in the lord by the way it's not just celebrating any kind of joy but the joy in the lord jesus and so that's why there is feasting that is why there is celebration there is true joy in the midst of the fellowship of god's people that's why in the midst of the joy there is feasting not fasting sometimes but there is a room for fasting Jesus didn't say that there will be no fasting for God's people that's not the answer he gave 
He says, there is a time when there will be fasting, but not now because my presence is with my disciples. As a bridegroom, I'm there and it is a time of joy and feasting. That's what he answers. And then that actually gives to us an understanding about fasting that we also should have. When we think about fasting, many a times fasting as from the pharisaical approach is seen as, as, a, as a traditional thing or, or a seasonal thing. There are those in this world who have seasonal fasting, 40 days. Right After that, they'll try to compensate whatever they have missed to eat again for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not the fasting that the Bible prescribes or rather Bible gives us. Christian fasting is not seasonal, it is not pharisaical, it's not traditional, but it is regular and it is intentional and it is confidential. That's why the Bible describes that true fasting is primarily concerned with being made right with God. Isaiah gives to us in Isaiah 58 verses 5 to 7, particularly 6 and 7, he says that it is to do justice and love in action that is essential prerequisite for true fasting. Unless you are made right with God, there is no seeking. By the way, the primary goal of fasting is seeking for the presence of God. Seeking for an intimate time with the Lord, for a word of encouragement, for something of an intervention that the Lord, that we want our Lord to do. That's the reason for the fasting. Many times people fast in there before a TV, trying to just enjoy and just while away the time not to think about food. But that's not the fasting that the scripture gives to us. The fasting that you and I are called to is for seeking the presence of God. That's why Jesus says, I am with them. How can they fast when I am with them? You already, you already, the disciples have my presence already. Fasting is about seeking the intimate time with our Lord for a word, for a presence of His in the midst of what we might be going through. But it ought to be regular. It ought not to be just a seasonal thing. It ought to be an intentional one, wanting to get intimate with the Lord. Maybe for our spiritual revival, maybe for a word of encouragement from the Lord. And it also ought to be confidential. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 verses 16 to 18 about how fasting should be. Matthew 6 verses 16 to 18. He says that it ought not to be for the display of others. Thank God we don't call any of our prayers as fasting prayers just to say, okay, we are doing fasting prayers too. But that doesn't mean you should not have fasting. By the way. <laughs> it's between you and the Lord. It ought to be secretive. It ought to be confidential. And it ought not to be for uh, any other purpose. And so we see that this privilege of fasting is going to take us in an intimate time with the Lord and that is there as a portion of God's people but not as long as the Lord Jesus Christ was with his disciples. Moving quickly, more than just trying to answer the question about fasting, Jesus was taking a step forward. He's wanting the, these Pharisees and scribes who asked that question to understand a greater reality of this radical newness that Christ brings in rather than any repair work or patchwork. By the way, the pharisaical fasting is that they used to fast twice a week, I suppose. In Luke chapter 18, a Pharisee prays and says, I fast twice a week, right? He says that. Uh, I've heard some men of God who say, if you want to fast, maybe you can plan once a week or so. If you want to lose two more pounds, add one more day. That's what they suggest. <laughs> but that's not a fasting. Don't have fasting for other weight loss programs or anything. <laughs> that, is, that is not the goal of fasting, by the way. <laughs> well, uh, there could be other benefits such as that, but it is not the true reason why you and I should fast. Now, having said that, Jesus wants these Pharisees and scribes to understand 
a greater reality about the radically new work that Jesus does and the system that Jesus is bringing in, ushering in, as opposed to the old covenant system that is there, which has to do with the Mosaic law, from which the Pharisees have drawn all various kinds of rules and regulations of religiosity, external piety, to say that they are so religious and so pious. Now, in verses 36 onwards, Jesus talks about these two parables that I have already mentioned about. It is the parable of the Lord on old garments and old bottles. The interpretation is very simple and straightforward, but I would want to quickly jump into the, the core application part, which is essential for our lives. The interpretation is simple as um, just like how the old garment which is rented or which is torn, when you and I patch with a new garment, get a, a new garment, cut a small piece of it and try to use that to patch up the old garment, the reality is over time, because the new garment is more stronger and the old garment is weak, you and I can actually end up causing that rent to be more uh, bigger over time. And so the strength of the old garment is not same as the strength of the new garment. We understand that simply. In the same way, the old bottles and the new wine. The old bottles are not strong enough to hold the new wine. So much so that as the new wine ferments, the bottles will burst out, which is what Jesus gives in verses 36 to 38. By the way, this new wine and the new garment is the radically new system of teaching the message of the gospel and the new energy that comes in through the work of the Spirit of God cannot fit in into this old Levitical system. It is not going to fit in. What Pharisees and Sadducees are trying is that can you not teach just like us? They also should fast. That's their way of imposing something new that our the Lord's disciples have gotten to be fitted into the old. That's what they are trying to impose, to have Jesus teach them the old way of fasting. Now, what Jesus does is he says them that old can't fit in, so sorry, the new can't fit in into the old because it cannot contain it. Now, the thing about this new wine and the new cloth that Jesus is talking about is this new life that Jesus gives when an individual comes to be brought into this powerful work of regeneration. Christian life has to do with these, these three things that happen. I would just give to us and bring about two applications uh, as we come as to the close of my message. Uh, so here we see that the first thing that comes and begins any, any individual to become a Christian is the work of regeneration. You and I cannot become a Christian because you're going to a church. You and I cannot become a Christian because you're born in a Christian family. Neither you can become a Christian just because you're beginning to be part of a ministry and start playing the music or start doing some service or take care of some PowerPoint or stuff. You don't become a Christian externally or doing some kind of a ministry. You need an inside out change. And that ought to be a new birth. Which is why in John chapter 3 verse 3 and 5, Jesus, as he was talking to Nicodemus, who was the teacher of the Old Testament, and he asked this question where, how can I be born again? As Jesus says, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God and then unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is to those that are born again. Now this new birth, as Jesus talks about, is through water and through the Spirit of God. This new birth that Jesus talks about is explained to us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. As Peter says that you and I are to be born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. The water signifies about the word of God that regenerates us. 
and of course the spirit is for the holy spirit of god who uses the wo- word of god to quicken us you and i might not know how the regeneration happens and explain it but you and i would know the effects of it that's what jesus gives as he talks to the nicodemus now one thing we can understand from the scripture as how it happens is in ephesians chapter 1 ephesians chapter 2 sorry ephesians chapter 2 turn with me there if you can in verses 4 onwards our condition before you and i are regenerated is this you and i are dead in our sins and trespasses according to ephesians 2 verse 1 but this is what happens in verse 4 onwards but god who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with christ this work of quickening is what is regeneration it's just like a a a, a spark plug that ignites the engine and gets to begin to uh take off whether it be a plane or even a car that gets to drive now it is understood also in if you have dealt with uh, the warm uh, the the heater uh, the the centralized heating system has a uh, a pilot light uh, and uh, you have this spark a small spark that is there and uh, there is a a gas a line that is always there and you not only switch on the gas line but that spark uh, but that uh, the pilot light should be on and when as you are owning the gas as you have that pilot light on it actually begins to take off the the centralized heating system and then there's a big fire that comes inside to give the whole house the warm hot air and so is it with our lives the spark is this gospel that has that power that wrapped up message of the death burial and resurrection of our lord jesus christ and as you and i come to hear the gospel sometimes the longer you hear the gospel and you don't yield to the work of the spirit of god the more numb your conscience would become not to respond to it but when you and i come to hear the gospel as as god draws us you and i would come to see that spark of ignition where you are convicted that you are the sinner for whom christ died that he knew his death and he conquered death and as you and i appropriate that through faith god gives to us this new life we are born again we are made a brand new creation a new heart is given to us the old heart the stony heart this heart of sin and flesh the old desires are taken away you are made a new creation that work of regeneration has to happen to be a christian and i hope none of us here have not missed to be part of that work of regeneration that is how jesus newness begins it's not only a beginning by the way many times people think okay i'm born again i am a child of god that is enough and they don't start uh, growing in the lord and being part of god's family to grow together they think they have the bible they have a passport to heaven they don't they don't come in even to the bible study or even to the prayer meetings and uh, they, there is this assumption that growth and newness automatically happens only till they come to see the monotony that sets in the monotony is there is nothing new there is a dryness that is as if lack of freshness in how we worship god there is a lack of passion for the work of god there is a lack of uh and 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 this ex- this is help uh, this is well understood in this analogy that a man of god gives christian life is a life of walking uphill it seems it's like this either you are walking uphill or you are sliding back you can't stay there basically try to put a ball on a uphill road you only see that either it goes down or you can actually cause it to go up as you are pushing it right so so is it with christian life you always are either growing in the lord or backsliding and so may it be that 
you are being renewed daily. And that's what brings me to the second point, which is this, apart from the work of regeneration, there ought to be this work of transformation. This is a part and parcel of every Christian life as they are growing in the Lord. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul describes about this transformation that begins with our mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. As uh, we see, Paul goes about to describe to us the transformation that happens with the renewing of our mind. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, though you and I are a child of God, you and I are far from knowing the mind of God. God's ways are so high than your and my ways. That's why we come to read the Bible. We come to understand the way God thinks. And we are renewed in the way God reveals to us His thinking and His thoughts as we study the Bible. And uh, this renewing of mind happens and helps us to prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It teaches us what the will of God is, the mind of God is. We do Bible study not to gain more knowledge or information, but it is to know the mind of God and to think God's thoughts after Him. You and I are called, invited, welcomed to get into the mind of God and see what God is thinking. In the current time that you and I are living, are you taking that invitation? Are you partaking in the joy of studying in the word of God? Now, as opposed to that, we miss to understand, apart from, instead of this renewal, there is another kind of uh, activity that happens. In Galatians chapter 6, we come to read about a formula that works in, in our lives. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 onwards. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The foolish thing is that sometimes this happens in software industry as well. We try to give the same input and expect a different output. <laughs> We think, why is it not working? It's the machine that is the fault. But the input has been the same. The system is the same. How will there be new output? A different output. The thing is, we feed junk into our brain, whether it be the WhatsApp messages or the YouTube videos that get shared and the Facebook posts that gets liked. And we expect something new, something beautiful to come out of our mind. Not knowing what gets in is what comes out, right? The thoughts that come out of us is what we let in. And uh, that's why the Bible says, do not be mocked. Do not be deceived. Sorry, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he also shall reap. We are going to have this reaping policy. We don't sow a wheat seed and expect a, a corn, right? And that's what happens as the things that we let in, the thoughts of God. That's why the Bible gives us in Philippians chapter 4, think on these things as it gives this list of these things and you find these things nowhere else apart from the word of God. Philippians chapter 4 verses 8 onwards, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. We think CNN or Fox News has something new, honest report or good report or pure report, lovely report, far from the reality. It's only the word of God that has the true, pure, honest, lovely and good report because they're the thoughts of God to think God's thoughts after him. And so, we come to this work of renewal that needs to happen in the work of, in the second part of transformation. And so, Christian journey is becoming new 
by the perspective that God gives to us. Every day, we grow into becoming more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. We think the way He thinks. We behave the way He behaves. We cultivate the habits that He had. We begin. It begins with thoughts. It moves on to words. And over time, it becomes action. And what actions we do is what will eventually make our character. And so, this is the journey of how we become new. And so, as we partake in this renewal work, we come to understand that there is also a revival work that happens, which is why the aspect of fasting and prayer is in essential. Apart from the word of God that renews us, there is also the presence of God and the spirit of God who renews us. I want you to have us turn here in Titus chapter 2, chapter 3, verse 4. Paul gives to us how the work of regeneration is done by the Spirit and also the renewal. Titus chapter 3, verse 4. Let me read that for us. He says, But after the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of Holy Ghost. God, through the Spirit of God He has given us, He, he brings us into the presence of God. He quickens us again and again. This time it's not for regeneration but revival. Sometimes we need God to revive us. We need God the Spirit of God, to revive us, to empty ourselves and let Him fill us. That's why in Ephesians 5 verse 18 we read, verse 16 onwards, that we are to walk circumspectly in this world, redeeming the time, making the most of time. And then in verse 18 it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. And the filling of the Spirit of God is not so much about trying to speak in tongues or these, these, these tools or these, these gifts that God has given for the ministry, in, in whether it be the preaching or administration of these gifts. But primarily, they are centered around making us more like our Lord Jesus Christ. The work of the Spirit of God is to bring the fruit of the Spirit in us. The work of the Spirit of God to, is to make us more like our Lord Jesus Christ. And that happens when our self is emptied of us and we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God to let Him fill us. The Spirit of God is not going to be filling us unless you and I yield. You and I ought to yield letting go of our self and letting Him take over and letting Him fill us. And so that renewal and revival happens in the presence of God. And uh, these are the two ways in which God is transforming His people. Apart from the work of regeneration and transformation, we come back to Luke chapter 5 in closing. Here we see that the Pharisees were given this radically new work of regeneration and transformation that Christ does. He is not trying to fit in, but he is bringing in a totally And so, as we close here, um, I would uh, bring to us in verses 39, he says this, No man also having drunk old wine desireth new, for he saith the old is better. This he is speaking about the hardened hearts of Pharisees. If these two things are not happening, the work of regeneration and the work of transformation, it eventually is going to lead to this work of rejection. This work of rejection is what the portion of Pharisees and scribes is. They wanted that Jesus budge into this old system. And when Jesus doesn't budge in, they are ready to reject. And that's what we see. No man having drunk the old wine. These Pharisees and, and scribes are so filled with this old system. 
so filled with traditionality and religiosity and piety that they are not going to embrace the new. They say the old is better. Leading to the sad state of reality of rejection. Jesus is already in much love showing to them their heart condition. And may it be that you and I recognize that the work of regeneration and the work of and the work of transformation ought to be a part of all of God's children's life. Without that being a part, it is eventual, it is a matter of time that just like the Pharisees and scribes, they have been brought to a point of rejection, which is what we would see in the next chapters. They begin to go after in rejection, wanting to bring to crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, when we take note of that, we come to see that our Lord has given us a call as we read in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31. There is a bird that can carry a prey that is almost and beyond of its size. This bird, when it is living upon this earth, as age grows upon it, it's going to shed its feathers, it's going to have this beak of its, which is filled with all the calcium that, that uh, grows or that, uh, that fills up its beak and loses the sharpness, it is going to go to a secluded place and stay up there high up on the mountain for days as all the feathers are shed and it is going to cause its beak to be pounded to that mountain rock so that its beak is broken completely. And in that hiding place, it is so vulnerable that even it is vulnerable for smallest of the prey to eat of this small bird, this, this bird. Even a smallest bird can actually try to destroy or kill, or kill this bird. But as days grow by, in that secluded place of that mountain, this bird is going to grow new feathers. It's going to come back to have this new beak, much sharper than the one that it had in its youth. And so is it that the scripture calls, it, calls us as God's children to be those that would renew our strength like the eagles. Where the Bible talks about in Psalm 103 that David praises God in uh, this renewal work that God does. He says in Psalm 103, Who satisfies thy mouth with good things and so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. In uh, Isaiah, as we close, um, Isaiah 40 verse 31. Isaiah 40 verse 31, we read, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. This is the portion of God's children. That we are being renewed more and more as days go by into this beautiful image of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it is so radical, it is so inside out, it is so radically new that it won't be traditional or trying to fit into the old system. May that be the portion that God's children who, are being, who have been regenerated would also be transformed into the likeness of their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray and close and ask the Lord for his blessing upon this word. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for enabling us to come and receive thy precious word in the parable of the old garments and the parable of the old bottles, how you bring to us this radically new life of regeneration and transformation that your people bought with your precious blood are brought under. Here we are as we are people. Father, we long that you may make us new, inside out, more and more into thy likeness. And thank you, Lord, for you 
are making all things new. And Lord, help us to yield ourselves more and more to the work of your Spirit, that you may renew us and that you may fill us, that we may be emptied of ourselves and that we may live a life bringing glory and honor to you. Thanking you and praising you. I also pray for those that are yet to give their hearts to you, that today would be the day of quickening, the acceptable day, that you may bring forth this work of salvation in their lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.